The 1971 film Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is a classic. Everybody loves it, I love it. I grew up with this film playing on TV while I sat on the carpet playing with like Brio or Crazy Bones or something. I find it impossible not to adore this film and I think a lot of people feel that way. It's so cozy and heartwarming, but the film is absolute madness. And I don't just mean mad in that fun way that makes us love the film even more. You know, Wonka saying mad things that bamboozle the kids and the parents. What is this, Wonka? Some kind of fun house? Why, having fun? I mean, what the hell is going on from a story point of view? This film is inconsistent as hell. It's confusing, contradictory in its meaning. The more you look at this movie, the more it becomes baffling. And then the fact I still love it so much, despite how incomprehensible everything actually is, <laughs> maybe that's the true magic all along. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is, without doubt, the most confusing film I've ever seen. Why? Well, <laughs> be prepared for a big journey here. Okay, just to briefly set the scene, I think it's worth keeping in mind this film was made primarily as a marketing opportunity to sell chocolate. As a result, I think you'd kind of expect a straightforward, quaint, cosy film that followed the book fairly closely, made no bold changes in order to play it safe. However, there were a lot of changes from the book with this film. Roald Dahl was originally on board to write the screenplay for this, however eventually left due to creative differences after rewrites were made. And you end up with a film where Charlie's dad is not not present at all, there's a whole Slugworth villain subplot that didn't exist in the books, there's a greater emphasis on Wonka himself, and a scene in which Charlie steals fizzy lifting drink, almost causing the same sort of horrific death slash not actually death that all the other kids suffer. That's quite an odd change, considering the reason Charlie gets the chocolate factory in the end is kind of because he's the one good kid in that sort of old fashioned moral of the story way, always follow the rules, respect your elders be an obedient child and things will go well for you kind of stuff. So that change is weird, I'd just like to point that out before we begin seeing as I'm now going to proceed speaking only about this film and mining that for meaning rather than going back to the book. You might already be wondering why include a fizzy lifting drink scene that largely undermines the original moral of the book? Well that's a very good question, but first Grandpa Joe. Build up a little, build, build up a little boy. Smash all his dreams to be pieces. There's two common things to talk about when they mention this film. One is how fun Gene Wilder's performance is, and the second is how awful a person Grandpa Joe is. You've been on the internet, you know what I mean. The guy who claims he can't walk and hasn't gotten out of his bed in years, all the while Charlie's mum works endless shifts to scrape by, only then when Charlie wins a golden ticket suddenly Grandpa sings a song about I've got a golden ticket. Not you've got one Charlie, not even we've got one, I do. And then he miraculously can walk with great agility. Suddenly he's fine now that he conveniently has the chance to visit the chocolate factory. Also, it's him that encourages Charlie to steal fizzy lifting drinks. And, obviously, it is fun to laugh at that stuff. I watched this film with Kirsty the other day, and yeah, it's enjoyable to poke fun at Grandpa Joe. The family haven't eaten anything better than cabbage water in weeks, and yet Grandpa Joe gets money to spend on tobacco? From now on, I'm going to pay for your tobacco. Hang on a minute. I've got a goal. <laughs> you love the film, and you have a fun time affectionately laughing at its faults, laughing at Grandpa Joe, but it doesn't really mean he's a terrible person actually. For one, he's very old. None of Charlie's grandparents are expected to be working shifts. In the books, Grandpa Joe is 96. It's not specified in the film how old he is, but if Charlie's mum is working really hard shifts, of which we get a scene her working late on her own in a very claustrophobic room that emphasises her struggle, if all of that is only enough to get them cabbage water in a broken down house, then I think we should take more issues with her wages than with what a 96 year old 
old man is doing. Not to mention, Grandpa Joe's sudden ability to walk isn't meant to be taken seriously. This is part of the childlike whimsy of this film, part of the magic of hope and chocolate and the metaphor of an old man getting to feel like a little kid again because of this excitement. This is the transformative power of the golden ticket. There's no point where any of the other characters are accusing Grandpa Joe of being a fraud, so why should we? And in that sense, Grandpa Joe being bad is sort of a vague plot hole. Not exactly plot hole, but a thing you can pick holes in, have a bit of a laugh at. One aspect of a fun, cosy film that the writers probably just didn't think mattered. No one's going to watch this film with an in-depth, analytical approach, unless you're a YouTuber with no life. Um, so why take any of this seriously? Well, this is where the film gets confusing. Lovable Grandpa Joe that is a constant support to Charlie Farrell is obviously not actually a bad person, but have you ever considered how very similar he is to Willy Wonka. Let's consider that now, um, or now if you skip ahead in the timestamps, otherwise in another 90 seconds if you're happy to bear with me because I've got a World Anvil subscription. It's ours, Charlie. I've got a World Anvil subscription. Up in the sky. Slippers, World Anvil is a really cool thing, and they're still sponsoring me, till death do us part. <laughs> Listen to me passionately talk about them. World Anvil is an online tool for world building, the anviling of worlds, character creation, campaign building, story planning, and even writing, and a load more stuff that can be great for anyone with creative projects or games. I use it for the planning of my novel, my organisation is chaotic, so World Anvil really helps. I love the way you can create timelines of events with hyperlinks from those pages to a character bio or some other event or information or whatever. Like my memory isn't the best for the minor details of stuff I invent so when I'm reading back information about the history of my novel's world and I think who is this person I can only half remember or what order did these events happen in why did that become a social custom whatever I can very easily click a hyperlink to a different page I wrote and check. The ability to create entire timelines based on your own invented calendars and be able to link everything to it including changes in the maps for if a city gets destroyed or something like that. That is so damn cool. And there are other tools too. Not all of them are ones I need for my novel personally, but they all still look really handy and I've always found everything pretty easy to use. If it's your thing, they also have a Discord and they run all sorts of events and community support and stuff like this summer camp they've been running. It's all really great and I enjoy getting to promote them. So there is a link in the description and there's a pinned comment that entitles you to 40... 51% off. Yep, it's 51 now. All their subscriptions with the code tree. If you want to try it out first they have a free version so you can get familiar you know take your time take it out for a nice dinner and see and see where things lead yeah well down Bill. Both Grandpa Joe and Willy Wonka are characters that use a cane, despite clearly not needing one. Both are characters who at first limp and struggle to walk, only to miraculously suddenly become very agile. Both are the only two father figures for Charlie in this film, both accuse each other of being cheats, and they are the two characters Charlie is torn between at the climax of this film. Are these links deliberate? I honestly don't know. Part of me wants to believe Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is just a straightforward, fun movie that didn't think too hard about these kind of elements. That these links are just a coincidence, but then they did deliberately make these changes to the story, didn't they? They decided to cut Charlie's dad out of this film and deliberately made Willy Wonka more of a father figure than he is in the books, which directly causes more similarity between Willy Wonka and Grandpa Joe. And slightly tenuously, we could even add one more link, the thing that causes Grandpa Joe to call Willy Wonka a swindler and an inhuman monster in this film is that he builds up Charlie's hopes only to smash all his dreams to pieces. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces. And at the beginning of this film, Grandpa Joe is the one who keeps encouraging Charlie to buy chocolate, keeps telling him that he will win a golden ticket, he knows he's gonna win it, when realistically it's next to impossible. Just because Charlie wants it really badly or deserves it for being good doesn't mean it will happen. I've got the same chance as anybody else, haven't I? You got more, Charlie, because you want it more. You'll find one. Charlie's mum even chides Grandpa Joe for 
filling Charlie's head with false hopes. It's not fair to raise his hopes. Never mind. Go on, open it, Charlie. I want to see that gold. Stop it, Dad. She even sings a song telling him to cheer up. It's okay. She tells him there's no point feeling disappointed about a golden ticket he never had any real chance of winning. There are a hundred billion people in this world, and only five of them will find golden tickets. And after this contest is over, you'll be no different from the billions of others who didn't find one. But that, that doesn't mean his life won't get better. The lyrics go, look up, Charlie, you'll see a star. Just follow it and keep your dreams in view. Never mind the chocolate factory, you know. There are other better things to dream about in life. Look up, Charlie. And Grandpa Joe is directly opposed to this approach. He thinks Charlie will win a ticket and he actively encourages it despite what Charlie's mum says. And so, a couple of scenes later, the final golden ticket appears to be won by someone else. Charlie is crying in bed. How could Grandpa Joe do this? Build up Charlie's hopes only to smash all his dreams to pieces. It's only later we discover the last winner was a fake and that the real golden ticket is still out there. Spot of luck, really. In that sense, maybe Grandpa Joe is actually a swindler, a cheat, and all of the other things he accuses Willy Wonka of being? But that can't be true, can it, surely? I mean, okay, both of them actively press Charlie to pursue the dream of a lifetime supply of chocolate. Let's not forget Charlie doesn't know he's going to win a factory. They think the prize is just a lifetime supply, which is interesting in itself when you know this is the same film that also condemns Augustus Gloop for basically being gluttonous but winning a lifetime supply of chocolate as much as a person could possibly eat there's nothing wrong with that that's fine to go chasing after just as long as you don't eat it all I guess um, that's kind of inconsistent within the film but yeah maybe arguably that could all be true about Grandpa Joe except for one big point. These are good characters. Grandpa Joe and Willy Wonka can't be crooks and cheats because that would suggest they are bad people manipulating Charlie on a bad path when that's just simply not true here. They lead Charlie to his happy ending. This is a very warm and positive film about the good kid getting to inherit the chocolate factory. This is good, so why the hell are there suggestions about Wonka and Grandpa Joe possibly being swindlers? Well, let's look at Wonka then. Runka lunka dunka dee darn guards. Shut the hell up! Our introduction to Wonka is him literally tricking us. Yes, that could just be a simple bit of performative humour, or it could be an indication that we can't trust him as a character going ahead. Can't trust a man who then lies, distracts us with nonsense, or kind of gaslights his way out of any difficult questions people ask him. What kind of rubbish is that? I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. He does that constantly throughout this film, and we forgive him because it's fun. And besides that quick greeting, our first real experience of Wonka is him making the kids sign a massive contract with all sorts of small print they can't read. A scene that even includes Sam TV pointing out to us that contracts are for suckers, and Mike TV even then mentioning a story of a wife being made to sign a contract specifically so his husband could murder her and inherit her wealth. You don't add those hints in the film if this contract is nothing to worry about, you know? I love this bit in a film because it's just such a fun, dumb joke, but then again, yeah, it is a good indication of the sort of man Wonka might actually be. Maybe we should be taking this as more than just a dumb joke. Plus, the recent 2023 film, for whatever that matters, literally uses this small print tactic for the villains. It's the thing the villains do for one of the most villainous things in that film. These are just your standard T's and C's, but you're welcome to take a look if you want. And then the parallels between Oompa Loompas and slave labour are obvious. Wonka tells us the Oompa Loompas like it here and that he saved them and that it's actually a good thing, but why should we take his word when so much of everything else he says is complete nonsense or lies? So that's true as well, and he's obviously a dick to the kids. He doesn't care much when they fall into danger, and if anything seems to actively enjoy it... Don't just stand there, do something! Help. Police. Murder. As a side note, I can't help feeling sorry for the kids. Take them to a big room where you tell them everything is edible. Actively encourage them to eat anything at all they want. Encourage it. And we know how excitable and carried away kids do get with things. Don't mention at all that they shouldn't drink from the river. Let them get excited. And then only later tell them the river is made of chocolate when they become intrigued by it. Still don't mention not to drink from it then in a room where you've told them they can literally eat anything. Only put up any of warning 
happening when Augustus is actively trying to drink for it, and then blame it all on a child, an excitable child in a room entirely made of chocolates. <laughs> Shame him for being greedy. Suspense is terrible. He, he's gonna go this time. I hope it'll last. <laughs> okay, I think I am overanalyzing there. It's entirely in keeping with Roald Dahl for stories to be just a little bit mean-spirited, you know? It's a bit of mean-spirited humour. We're not meant to take it too seriously because those kids are just there to express a moral. Certain things children are supposed to learn not to do. Charlie is the good kid, therefore he gets the good rewards. But does he? Does he really? You see, the reason Charlie wins is basically because he does what he's told, right? And the reasons for giving him the chocolate factory are basically because Wonka is getting old and he wants someone who will do as he tells him to. He explains that adults would come up with their own ideas and ways to do things, not Wonka's way, whereas a child, a child is impressionable. A child can be made compliant and obedient to whatever Willy Wonka wants, so he finds the most compliant boy he can and he puts him to work. A grown up would want to do everything his own way, not mine. That's why I decided a long time ago that I had to find a child. Let's not forget this is a man who essentially fired all of his original workforce for having minds of their own in a way, and replaced them with obedient slaves who aren't allowed to leave the factory ever. Now, quite similarly, we have an impressionable boy who, alongside his family, will all be moved into the factory, and presumably also never be allowed to leave. That just kind of dampens the happy ending, doesn't it? <laughs> Plus, Wonka's not even old! What's all this about him not being able to go on forever. That's the whole point of his agile forward role when we meet him, you know? It undermines the idea of him being old and weary. No, this is a happy ending because Wonka tells us it's a happy ending. He says, Don't forget what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he always wanted. What happened? He lived happily ever after. But is this everything Charlie ever wanted? Wonka tells him it is, but is that actually true? What if this is just an impressionable kid being told this is what he wanted? Yes, we are going deeper into over-analysis now. I cannot help it though, because this film is so inconsistent in itself. If it's meant to be a happy ending, if Wonka is meant to basically be a good guy and a caring father figure, then why the hell does this film explicitly show him doing bad things all the time? And it's about to get even even more confusing because Charlie has perhaps the most insane character arc in any film I have ever seen. And I'm not even exaggerating here. You know how we're introduced to Charlie? We see the poverty he lives in, we learn that they've been eating nothing but cabbage water for weeks, and well, good old Charlie has been saving up the money from his paper round and has been able to buy a loaf of bread. Obviously this is a very good thing, it's a delight for the family, they can finally eat something proper to survive. That's his start point in this film. And then Charlie learns about this golden ticket scheme, and naturally he dreams about winning it, getting to see the inside of this factory and winning a lifetime supply of chocolate. It sounds exciting. Grandpa Joe dreams about it too, and he encourages the idea, so next time, rather than buy a loaf of bread to support the family so they can eat again, Charlie buys a chocolate bar. They're both ultimately hoping for a golden ticket, and they don't get one, and Charlie is sad about this. But his mum comforts him. Yes, it is sad, Charlie, but this is life. She sings a beautiful song that tells him you can't pin all your hopes on some near impossible chance of a golden ticket to miraculously solve everything. You can't do that. Keep going, keep following your dreams, your actual dreams, not this sudden new impulsive desire for chocolate that has erupted, but your actual dreams. Follow your star and life will get better. And yeah, you could argue her singing about his dreams does mean chasing the chocolate, perhaps that is his dream, but she's already dissuaded him from chasing that in their conversation just before. It's a beautiful scene, but doesn't convince Charlie, perhaps because she's singing it after Charlie's left the room, <laughs> um, but Charlie finds some more money in a drain. Does he buy bread to feed himself and his family? No. He buys chocolate again, not even for the hope of a golden ticket because he thinks the last one has been found. No, he just wants chocolate, and he devours it far more speedily than Augustus Gloop eats anything in this film. Not that there's anything wrong in eating quickly, I'm just pointing out the hypocrisy, um, but he eats it and then buys another chocolate bar with this money to eat by himself, only this one has the golden ticket in. Charlie has won. You see the arc? Don't be selfless, Charlie, or not even just selfless, don't do the positive, moral, obvious thing that allows you and your family to actually survive. Forget that. 
buy our product, buy and eat chocolate in impulsive moments of desire. We will reward you for that, consume product with reckless decadence and the world will gift you a golden ticket. That's insane surely and yes yes it is the film even tells us it's insane hence all these little cutaway scenes of people going pretty much hysterical for wonka chocolate teachers abandoning their classes president shipping in wonka bars by the van loads the queen bidding on crates at auctions one woman has her husband kidnapped and she says she'll do anything to get him back but when the kidnappers phone in and say they want her case of wonka bars as a ransom suddenly she's not sure suddenly she needs time to think this over do i want my husband or the Wonka bars. <laughs> it's all clearly quite mad. We're not supposed to see this stuff and think, well yes, this is sensible behaviour, it is a golden ticket after all. We're supposed to laugh and go, look how ridiculous these people have all become. We're supposed to think like Charlie's mum. Yes, you'd want a golden ticket, but it would be mad to lose yourself in this frenzy. But Charlie does kind of lose himself and he is rewarded with a ticket and that's a good thing now? It doesn't make any sense. It goes against everything the film has just been telling us. How can we be pointing and laughing at these people going mad for chocolate in one moment and then see it as positive and sensible when Charlie is passing up the chance to feed himself and his family and instead devour a chocolate bar? It simply does not add up. It is baffling. And it gets even more extreme than that because we then get the Slugworth subplot. And to emphasize this again, this subplot isn't even in the books. They specifically wrote this into the film. So all of this is a deliberate decision, okay? Slugworth is the head of a rival chocolate company and he goes to every winner of the golden ticket. Apparently he's able to just zap in out of nowhere like a guard from an Elder Scrolls game. Stop right there, criminal scum! And just try and make a deal with the kids. His deal is that he wants them to steal an everlasting gobstopper from Wonka's factory. Just steal one and bring it to Slugworth so that he can figure out its secret formula and then sell his own version of them. Otherwise, Wonka will run him out of business. That will cause loads of workers to lose their jobs actual workers as well, not slaves, and cause Wonka to gain a total monopoly on the chocolate market. But Slugworth is evil, because he has a scar on his face, and the film plays sinister music when he's on screen. Whereas Wonka doesn't have a scar, and whenever he's on screen the music is cheery and full of charisma. Well, except for that one bit where Wonka deliberately scares the shit out of everyone for no clear reason whatsoever. Yeah, that's another point to add to the tally of reasons why Wonka is a bit of a dick. <laughs> Um, Slugworth though, right? He even offers Charlie £10,000 to bring him a gobstopper. He even specifies to Charlie that this would be enough to get his family a new house, one that's not falling apart. And you think, that's good, right? Of course do that. Your family's survival matters far more than chocolate. Wonka might not even give you a lifetime supply. You might not win against the other contestants. Whereas this man will help you afford something you and your family deserve as a basic human right. Of course choose to help him. Of course that's good. Well, no. <laughs> We've seen where the arc is going. Choosing breads over chocolate is a bad thing to do. So when we get to the end of the film and Wonka tells us, oh, don't worry about the other kids, they're all fine. Which is hard to believe when we don't actually see them again and when Charlie very nearly got cut to pieces by the blades of a fan. Yeah, after that, he tells Charlie that he doesn't win a lifetime supply of chocolate because Charlie broke the rules. Rules he didn't even know existed because they were written in small print that was never explained. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. Grandpa Joe is correct. They have been swindled. Setting up a promise to a child and then reneging on it because of small print they were manipulated into signing. Yes, it was wrong to steal the fizzy lifting drinks, but that doesn't mean Wonka is good here either. Charlie wins nothing. Nothing at all. There is nothing to possibly gain from giving Wonka back his everlasting gobstopper. Don't do it, Charlie. Don't do it. Go to Slugworth and get 10,000 quid instead. Grandpa Joe even suggests as much. Screw Wonka. He's just a cheat anyway. Well, no. Charlie gives back the everlasting gobstopper and he gives no real adequate explanation as to why he does that. He just does it because, I guess, stealing is wrong. Correct. Oh, thanks. Because he feels bad for Wonka? 
because he feels a level of loyalty towards this undeniably bad and yet very charismatic man. And the film celebrates this moment. Well done, Charlie. You've forgone morality and basic survival in place of loyalty to a bad person. Charlie has again done the wrong thing, but just like in miraculously winning the golden ticket before, he is now miraculously rewarded with a chocolate factory. Turns out it was all a trick. Slugworth actually works for Wonka. That's not the real Slugworth. It was all just a test to prove, uh, to prove Charlie is impressionable enough and in awe of Wonka enough that he will do anything Wonka wants him to do. What a happy conclusion. <laughs> um, what the hell are we supposed to make of any of this? Uh, <laughs> well, I tried to consider that and yeah, prepare for me to go a bit mad with overthinking. Are you ready? If this is just a simple happy film that accidentally carries bad messages for plot hole reasons, then why is so much emphasis deliberately placed on Wonka being a bad person? Emphasis placed on the hysteria being ridiculous, the idea of buying bread and his mum thinking something to get out why something, but the is that he's very happy. Does that then make Grandpa Joe the good guy for trying to argue with Wonka and trying to tell Charlie to help Slugworth? But then why is Grandpa Joe the good guy for Joe is the one who actively encourages Charlie to chase after chocolate. Charlie's mum is the polar opposite to Wonka, really, not Grandpa Joe, only the the allure of chocolate is so powerful that her character gets completely forgotten in this film and is never seen again after a third of the movie. So is it then pro-capitalist propaganda that simply has a ton of holes and inconsistencies because most propaganda does and just encourage not to think about those problems? But that doesn't line up either because then why paint people's obsession with Wonka chocolate as such a bad, mad thing? Look, I'm normally very calm and sincere when I record all of my videos on this channel, but it, it does genuinely rile me up. I get so confused by this film. And the more I think about it, suddenly there's only one conceivable interpretation I can make about this film. The interpretation I don't want to make, but kind of have to now. The whole thing is a complete satire. Yes, of course it's a bad thing people are obsessed with chocolate, that Charlie chooses chocolate over bread, Wonka over £10,000. It's deliberately absurd the way all of it is painted as a happy ending, even the phrase Don't forget what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he always wanted. What happened? He lived happily ever after. That even sounds too good to be true. We are not supposed to trust Wonka or the factory or any of this. Like the tour guests, we're meant to try and pull him up on the lies and the nonsense he tells them. We're meant to question the morality, the factory safety, everything. Only, like them, we don't. Our concerns get washed away by the allure, the bright colours, the music and the charisma of this man. We forget all of it and lull ourselves into the comfortable message that, yes, buying Wonka chocolate is good. And when children potentially die, we're told not to worry about them. We're told they're probably fine. We're made to feel like it's not too serious via Wonka making a joke out of it, telling us to see it like a joke, to laugh. And even if it is serious, then it's not his fault. It's the kids' fault, and they actually deserved it, apparently. Here's a very catchy song to convince you of that fact. But we don't question any of it, because this is the power of a charismatic, influential, rich bloke. This is the power of his influence and of propaganda. He's not bad, he's just an eccentric genius that we should support because maybe one of us will win a golden ticket. Here's to another week of eating cabbage water. And by this interpretation, Grandpa Joe isn't a bad guy at all. He's a flawed man, yes, he's arguably a little bit selfish in moments. He definitely gets swept up in the appeal of this lottery, just as almost everyone else does. The excitement and joy runs a bit too wild and leaves him singing about himself rather than Charlie for a moment, but he's not a bad person. He still basically got his heart in the right place and wants to stick up for Charlie. He does still love his grandson, only we're made to feel differently because that's the power of framing. Blame the kids, not Wonka. Blame Grandpa Joe, not Wonka. Everyone is bad, but the guy who is actually clearly very bad. At the climax of this film, Charlie finds himself torn between two men. One who has made some mistakes and has zero rewards to offer, but he loves his grandson. And another who has a ton to offer, but his motives are unclear. Charlie chooses option two, where option one is then made to suddenly feel like a bad choice. I had to test you, Charlie, and you passed the test. 
You won! You know, actually from this perspective, suddenly it makes sense that the film is named after Willy Wonka rather than Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like the book was called. What we get here is a story from Wonka's perspective that alters the framing to suit him. But look, the thing is, I don't want to believe this interpretation. I find it ruins all the wonderful childlike joy this film has always represented to me. I felt sad watching the ending where Wonka says this line about getting everything he ever wanted. I felt sad because I think I didn't believe it. I wanted to, but I don't anymore. I've lost my childlike simplicity perhaps, and I think that merged with the fact we've lost Gene Wilder, merged with the fact I've lost the grandparents that I can so vividly remember watching this film with, it makes me sad. It's not just that that time in my life is gone, it's also that trying to look back I can't feel the same way I used to feel anymore. It does make me sad. And you know, I even still don't entirely buy this interpretation anyway. I think Roald Dahl's original story was already something kind of troubling, and for this film they tried to work around those elements, whilst also playing some of it up as a, like a nod to the parents' humour about how ridiculous it all was. But even if that is true, even if my interpretation is total overthinking, now... After the release of a 2023 Wonka film that is kind of a prequel to this one, now is the perfect time to re-examine and perhaps reinterpret its meaning, because remember, without spoiling a new film, the villains there used the trick of small print to effectively rope characters into slave labour, and if this is a prequel to the Gene Wilder film, then we have to imagine a young Wonka seeing this trick, going, oh, that's a good idea, I'll use that on children later down the line. <laughs> and it kind of sets up a scenario where Wonka might be on a gradual villain arc. I don't know if they'd be bold enough to do that, were they to make a sequel to Wonka, but it's an interesting idea at the least, and it's certainly the most straightforward way to, to make Charlie and the Chocolate Factory less troubling for a modern audience. It would, in that lens, cause you to look at Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka as a villain, and when you do, yeah, suddenly the film becomes a a very consistent satire, a satire so strong I don't even want to believe it's a satire. I guess at the end of it all that's why I find this film so confusing because I don't know which perspective to look at it from anymore. I have no idea what the filmmakers intended but I think after all of this I don't care. Sometimes you just draw your own meaning from movies, you know? It meant something innocent to me as a kid. I'm sad I've lost that, but now apparently it means this, and I enjoy the fact it could mean two different things at different points in my life. That's one of the great things about stories, isn't it? At the end of the day, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is fun. That's why it's endured all these years. I still enjoy it, whether that be as a slightly mean and thinly wholesome kids film, or as a a bizarre and surprisingly clever satire. I don't know, either way, it's fun to watch, that's... That's all you're getting for a conclusion, I'm afraid. As for the Tim Burton version, well, I am planning to watch that with Kirsty this weekend, so maybe you'll get a video on it. I don't know, it depends how this one does. The last Wonka video hasn't done great yet, but maybe. Otherwise, let me know what the hell you think. I'm really interested to know what anyone thinks about this one. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe, maybe support me on Patreon, but... Otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Luke Hoare, Treat Tree Caber, Michael Gallagher, Flying Spider, Kellyanne Davidson, Billy Lee Myers Jr., Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, and Michael Hart. Thank you.